All right. Now I guess we're ready for our feature guest. Everybody, if you look on the back, you can see he's got lots of awesome credits. And he likes to blow things up and has been blowing things up for a very, very long time. Everyone, please welcome Chris Finney. Some, uh, some of you have no lot in here, and uh, some of you recognize some of the firework. Uh, it was Tom Ward. It was uh, kind of fun to play with Tom. Unfortunately, the, some of those was just like a little boy playing with a lighter. If you know Tom, a half a pound of black powder will do it. He'll use six and a half pounds. <laughs> some of those were a little big. That uh, Posse was supposed to be an 1800s cannonball hit. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys were on there or not. I was there. Oh boy. The heat was intense. And so anyway, so I, I got in this business uh, 32 years ago now. And uh, about four years ago, I was inducted in the Taurus World Stunt Academy, which was a lot of fun. And that's uh, where we were when Rosie called us out at uh, Paramount Studios and joined that. And uh, the Phoenix Fire thing, the, one of the guys burning in the black suit is uh, Terry James and uh, a good friend of mine, and he just won an Emmy for The Young and Restless. So there are some words out there, I guess, for us. <laughs> so anyway, I got started in the business years ago. I, I came on the, it's kind of funny, there's a big white spot on the mountain towards Benson called the Ocotillo Ranch. And I was driving, saw all the lights and got curious as a normal person would, and I drove out and ended up being a movie set. I was greasy, covered from head to toe, working on a semi, and they said, oh, you must be a mechanic. And I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a mechanic. So I went on up and it was a movie called World Gone Wild with Bruce Dern, Michael Perry, and Adam Ant. And I ended up, uh, ended up fixing some stuff and doing mechanical work. And uh, so I, I started working uh, Bob, Bob Hayes, who was back the ways. I worked uh, uh, Poker Alice with Liz Taylor out of old Tucson Studios and some of the old stuff out there with him as a mechanic and kind of worked my way up. And it, it kind of sounds funny that I'm a mechanic and end up as a stunt coordinator, but there's a, there's a reason for this. Um, my mom got sick of cancer and sent me to school to be an EMT to uh, help take care of her and when she was flying back and forth to Chicago to the cancer center. So I became an EMT and then found out that uh, the set medic made a whole bunch of more money than I made. So I applied for that and started working there. And what was fun is, uh, when, is if you're a firefighter, I joined the local fire department and learned fire. So when you're a firefighter and an EMT and working the safety end of it, coming up, I stuck my nose in a lot of it. And since I was a firefighter, I knew a little more about the fire than some of the guys and you know some of the stunts and stuff. And I got involved with it that way. So we ended up. Uh, I ended up uh, asking one day. Um, Terry James was standing there and I said, he says, uh, well, today we're going to drive this uh, 78 Suburban off the cliff. Who wants to do that? And I took a step forward. <laughs> and he says, why did I figure that you would do that? Some of it messes with bombs and disarms. By the way, a lot of that, I disarm the explosives. Tom Ford is our, uh, we have about three licensed uh, guys in the state of Arizona. Tom Ford is one. Uh, Cor uh, Corey Star. Corey Star. And now we have uh, Amos is now licensed. Yeah, so there's at least three that I know of. So, you know, if you ever do something, please make sure you use a licensed guy so you don't get in trouble for doing it because the state marshals look kind of down on you when you set uh, the community center on fire. We'll kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. <laughs> and, you know, that's unfortunate that we didn't use Arizona qualified people because our people know that you don't use walnut dust anymore. They, don't, they banned it in California. So if they have been using, I think, qualified people that have known that. That's my opinion. Um, anyway, let's see where we I do have notes. Like I said, we've been on the road for several weeks, so I had to jot some stuff down. Um, so that, anyway, that's kind of how I got into doing the stunts. And then uh, from there, I just kept doing it and doing it. And I grabbed every chance I could to fall down, get beat up, get blown up. Uh, for Tom Ford, a lot of this stuff, what I did was the really crazy stuff. I went into the fire after they called cut and disarmed the explosives so they didn't go off. So, yeah, we're not cases. 
That's the only people. So anyways, um, the nice thing, you know, a lot of these in stunts now, since we went to the Charles Academy Awards, one of the things they said that, that a lot of the directors and stuff are trying to bring back is live stuff. You know, the, the CG stuff has just gotten so out of hand and has put a lot of stunt guys out of work. But, you know, that was one good thing that I, I, I heard from them. Uh, uh, upcoming, a lot of the directors are going back to uh, real stunts like uh, Fast Five. Uh, one of the awards that was won by a friend of ours uh, rolled the big bus in that. And, I mean, you know, so they're, they're doing a little less CG work. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that some of it you can't, can't help but do, but uh, because of safety values. And it, that's uh, one thing I wanted to talk about, too. I noticed on a lot of sets where we do stunts and stuff, and pyros and stuff, they don't do enough safety meetings. You know, one thing that I always try to do on ours is that we set a, a balloon out about 25 feet. And I can actually pop that balloon with, from 25 feet away with a blank. You know, so then you wonder why people play them with guns and that concussion, they stick at their head or aim it um, too close to somebody. Then that's, that's where people get hurt. So, and the other thing is, you know, when we're, when we're talking about that, I've done a lot of film. Accidentally, I happen to be on the film, and they said, oh, uh, we were doing a Kanye West film at the Grand Canyon. And they said, uh, well, did, uh, my buddy came over and said, you hear, you know, we're doing all this driving with this limo. I said, I didn't hear anything about it. He said, well, they got an extra coming from town that's going to drive this limo 98 miles an hour down the north rim of the Grand Canyon and slide the thing sideways. <laughs> you know, so it's, to me it's really important that you use qualified uh, coordinators and people that can avoid that kind of stuff because that guy could have drove off the canyon. You know, luckily for us, I was there and, we, and I went to the producer and kind of bumped his head against the wall and he said, you know, I said, you're going to end up with a limo and the guy driving off the canyon if you don't know what he's doing. You know, you get a helicopter chasing you, you're doing 98, an old, old car. You know, and the, and the other thing, using uh, um, qualified coordinators, I did uh, uh, Major League Baseball uh, All-Stars in Phoenix. And uh, we had four cars, they were all like the Blues Brothers cars, and we were driving around Phoenix up and down the roads and sliding around and stuff. First day I saw the cars was the first day of filming. They wanted me to go down 4th Avenue and do a 360. And I said, absolutely not. No. You know, and you know, I felt bad for telling them no, but you know, you, you got to have qualified people that are not afraid to say no and why you can't do it. You know, which brings me to why I went to film school because I, was, I kept telling directors, no, you can't do that, it's unsafe. Well, how am I going to get the shot? <laughs> I don't know. So I went to film school, I went to Hollywood Film Institute and learned, you know, camera angles and things like that. So now I can tell the director, you can't do that, that's unsafe, but I'll show you how to get that shot. You know, so that's always important, like I said, you use the qualified people. So, and you know, one of the things I know that all a lot of you guys are working on with all these kind of committees and stuff is, is uh, using Arizona people. And I would like to see that a lot more too because when we did uh, Piranha 3D, well, it's a funny story, I called them up because they advertised in the newspaper says you must be an Arizona resident to work on the film. So, okay, I live in Arizona. I'm a stunt coordinator. I'm the Taurus World Stunt Academy stunt coordinator. And they said, well, uh, we already have a guy from California. <laughs> and I said, all right. I thought the article said you had to live in the state of Arizona. They said, well, he's a Taurus member. I said, well, so am I. They hung up on me. <laughs> so they fired that guy and brought in a second guy. So I called him back again. I said, what's going on? Get in a P.O. box in Lake Havasu who doesn't qualify to be an Arizona resident. They hung up on me. <laughs> So I hope that some of the work you guys are doing in some of these committees will put a stop to that. There are more than enough qualified people in this state to do any job that we need on a film. And I've been in it 32 years, I've seen it. I've worked in California, you know, I've worked with Fred, Mark, a lot of these people in here, and they're just as good as those people out there. So I hope that, you know, you guys keep these committees and things going towards that. Um, of course, I just went off the page. I was back here so many times. <laughs> I told you I get started talking about this stuff, and I just go, oh, I don't need a script. I did, that's funny because a lot of times people say, you know, I, I play a part of Huge Devil. I don't know. 
that said, stand over here and die and get beat up. <laughs> I never know until the movie comes out. Well, who's in the movie? I don't know. I was here one day. <laughs> I've never seen a movie. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing, too, that I've noticed is a lot of, in a lot of the movies that I've worked in recently, a lot of the directors are starting to hire the stunt guy to play the bad guy, play the part. It makes it so much easier. Because <laughs> I get, you know, I walk in the first day and I see some guy and it's like, Fred, you're going to take a fall today, but I have to double you because you can't do it. I'm going to find somebody who looks like him. <laughs> Not too many people I work with look like Fred. <laughs> so at least they're, you know, they're starting to use the stunt guys to play the bad guys and stuff like that, which I'm happy because I'm, I'm getting parts and I'm doing it too. You know, I love the business and I wouldn't do anything, wouldn't do anything different. Now that I lost my place, anybody have any questions? <laughs> I do. Um, I know that safety protocols and all that are pretty universal throughout, whether you're in California or China or wherever. Um, how, what do you think the costs are like from a stunt coordinator's point of view shooting in California and shooting here? Um, I know I know that in Arizona they do not have, have the AFA, F, AFSA and the FSA program, which is fire safety officer. And um, once if you're doing a lot of major stunts, you can use a retired guy. If you're doing some a lot of fire work and major stuff, you have to use a working active guy yeah, as a safety officer. But I mean, there's programs here that we don't have that they they use there. You know what? Let's, let's just say from a percentage point of view, <coughs> let's say in California, let's say it's 100%, right? Um, let's say uh, the stunts require one explosion and one car over the hill, for example. Um, how much better, faster, and cheaper can we do it in Arizona? Um, it's probably going to cost you the same. Okay. <laughs> because one thing that I know that I've done a stunt, a driving stunt, I gave the people a price of... of what they wanted was just slide up, you know, 300 bucks. But that was their budget. They said, we can't pay no more. So I accepted it. I get a phone call from California. It says, well, what the hell are you doing? You're not moving for $300. The rate's five. So, you know, the stem world's a smaller world, I think, than some of them. You know, like Grip Electric guys, I, I think their little world's different. Ours is watched a little closer because there's not, there's really not that many of us. So they try to regulate it. Yeah, they, they do. And if I if, if I do something for cheap, I hear about it. And then, go ahead, Fred. And the other thing is a lot of the, like example in the grip department, they're now being debriefed on a lot of the safety stuff in order to keep an eye on what these guys are doing <coughs> just in case something happens. They have a, a series of people to go to on that. But one thing that seems to be not looked on the on the independent filmmaker POV towards stunts and effects it's, it, it's all going to vary on your insurance liability on the production uh, you whip out a, put it this way, if you use a real gun versus a movie gun your insurance is going to go through the roof and if your film is distributed with you using a real gun, and everybody, it's obvious, then you're going to get hammered on the back end. Well, especially if you don't have an armor. That's, see, this is you have to have an Like I said, you got to have qualified people. You have an armor to make sure there's no live. We were just doing Dead Man, and I was standing there in costume, and the armor had gone to the bathroom and came back, and I was standing looking at the new guy that just came on, had a full belt of live ammo. I kind of tapped him and I said, uh, this is a new guy. And he says, yeah, this is, check his gun. And he says, oh, oh. <laughs> so, you know, that, yeah, you got to have, have an armor on there, too. So, and those guns. When we worked on Stardust together, that was the first time I'd ever seen, uh, been on a set where I watched these shots. And I was fascinated to know that they were shooting paintballs with dust in them. Can you tell us some of the other tricks? that are used to help get that effect so that and right. why you bullet, want bullet dust to fly and yeah. just tell, I, teach us how to do some of those. Yeah, I kind of shot at Cherry's dress once because uh, Ace <laughs> was shooting from the balcony at her and I was just off to the side tell. shooting at her dress and they're just, it's just fuller's earth in a hard shell that breaks and makes it look like a bullet. Um, 
they have Zerk kits that have little sparks in them, but Zerk kits require a pyro guy to buy. You, know, you can buy dust. Uh, you could get uh, a Vaseline in them that hit a window, you know, that looked like a bullet hit. So, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's several different tricks. You can drill the holes and put squibs. These are um, paintball balls? Just paint, well, no paintballs, and then there's squib hits. That they, they go back over to car body and do the whole body and everything, and then uh, pyro guy sets them all off. It looks like all the bullet hits in it. Could you go back and explain to maybe the folks that don't aren't familiar with firearms the difference between a real gun and a movie gun? For okay. example, how an automatic sight right. a blank. Well, see, and that's a good thing because if you have if you have a blank firing automatic, you have to have a special gun because the spring is too strong in a real gun to cycle the shell. And, uh, you know, one of the things that everybody always asks is about the Bruce Lee thing, and I'm sure by now everybody knows, but just so you know, he, they had dummy rounds, which are bullets that there's no powder, no blank, and no primer on it, and they were messing with the gun, and the lead came loose and lodged in the barrel. Then they put blanks in the gun, and he drew the gun and shot it. It's, it's a live round. The bullet's just a little further away from the shell instead of being on it. So, you know, now we, <clears throat> our armor should come up and present uh, whoever they design, uh, designate as their safety guy, the first AD or whoever, and we usually run a rod down the cylinder to show you that it's, you know, two or three people will look at it, so it's become a really big to-do. Um, they have also a plugged barrel gun. When somebody's shooting, it just puts a little puff of smoke and they loop the sound in later for the, for the big bang. Is that what happened to the actor uh, John Eric Hexel on, uh, the, on, on the set about 25 years ago? No, I think I think what he did is he actually just had a blank. Mm -hmm. And I think you missed the part when I said one of the demonstrations that we do a lot is we put a balloon 25 feet away, and I can shoot the balloon with a blank and pop the balloon. Mm -hmm. There's still particles and compression coming out of that shell. You know, there, there are different levels of, of loads and right. depends on who you're working with and inside or outside, and, but that doesn't always go either. And the, the, the thing's been bounced around in his truck and he's got sand back there and it picked up a little sand or something, he's still got a line around. So, you know, there's a coordinator too that's my when I'm pointing a gun here and I go, you need to you know, point over here and move your camera. So you learn camera angles versus, you know, it's kind of like when they tell an actor to find his own light. You know, an actor can feel the light, see the light. You know, set planners and set people do the same thing. It's if I'm going to, you know, I'll punch, punch somebody, I've got to work around where the camera's at to, to make that look right. I mean, we, some of us come pretty close, but you get some actors that <laughs> do, the, do the John Wayne and swing way over here, and there's, you know, four foot in between, and you can only hide so much of that. So sometimes it's not going to have to come into it. Oh, I mean, we get, you will get hit. <laughs> Could you explain the five and one blank? The five and one. Okay, what are you talking about? Uh, the, the, the dip, why it's called a five and one? With the with how it works? Oh, yeah, it's four and one, five and one. It's a uh, back when the westerns started rolling out, and they had. We the, probably call it something different. Yeah, and um, it's neck down. So there was a series of of weapons that were bored to only hold that fire that. Yeah. However, there were rifles, the Western Winchester repeaters. They still didn't quite get on the market yet of making those regularly. And this is, we're talking the 1930s, okay? So then, they found, figured out if they made this 5-in-1 or 4-in-1, is another nickname, that it would cycle through the Winchester lever action and go into the, all the pistols everything from what was a 44 to a 45. And all they had to do on the 44s, instead of reaming out the barrel, the rest of the cylinder, was just remount the back end where it started to taper down. And therefore, that's, that was the beginning of the 5-in-1 or 4-in-1. Yeah, because well, I mean, in, nowadays in modern film, they, there's a lot of the guns that are just all the same caliber. You know, back when we were doing it, it was like, you know, they were the real deal. And, you just took and made blanks for them. They had to armor, check everything to make sure that they were shooting blanks. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Some of the shots that we saw, explosions were ten times bigger than, say, the building that they were in. Mm -hmm. Except 
That's Tom Ford. <laughs> <laughs> Is it as dangerous as it looks? In other words, is nobody in the yard? Well, uh, Ron got pretty <laughs> Ron disappeared in that sheriff's building. Um, we laugh about Tom, but he's, he's a good guy. And he, does, he does put on a good show, but he loves to play with the pyros. Um, they're flash pots. They'll take that metal tapered, either round or tapered. And uh, the one you saw with the police cars, we spent three days prepping those things. Um, cabling the hoods and doors in case they come off so they wouldn't go quite so far. I mean, 120 feet in the air was quite a ways for that hood, but it did have a cable on it, which was made to shoot and then break, but to slow it down. And uh, those cars were full of uh, round pots and uh, tapered pots aiming different directions and gasoline and black powder charges. And there was a, there was a lot, quite a bit of stuff. The, the posse one was one that just really cracks me up because it was a the, the day that I met Tom, I was, <laughs> on that one, I said, uh, well, what all are we having here? And us fire safety officer besides helping them. He says, well, there's 120 gallons of uh, av gas, 80 pounds of black powder, and 400 gallons of liquid propane. <laughs> <laughs> I said, my God, what is it? And he says, an 1800s cannibal. I said, that's a cruise missile. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Tom Ford. Okay, and one of the shots, the explosion in the background, coming toward it down the street, a man on horse going over. I had a concern for the horse. Was the horse all right? Those horses, um, we use one on dead men, and if you tug on his reins just right, he goes over. They try not to hobble. You know, the old way was trip, trip wires and yeah, stuff like that. Illegal. Yeah, yes, no, it's all done humanely, and the animals are very trained. Um, Sherry and I worked on one film called uh, Blue Lake Massacre, that one of the ladies that do the Luberderm commercial with the big alligator brought some wolves out. No, that was, yeah, that was a yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, they had the wolves. I mean, okay. you know, a head on a hybrid wolf's about that big, and I'm down there trying to cover its little mark, and it's kind of nipping at my hand. But I mean, they're very, very trained. These animal people are just, they're amazing with some of the stuff they do. Chris, on that, uh, that shot that Bob was talking about with the horse, uh, one of the things, uh, and maybe it's an editing thing, but, but uh, when I was looking at, the, at that, that clip or series of clips, it, it, it gave an impression that the horse was enveloped by the fire that was closed yeah. out that Yeah, way. well that's you know, what we were talking about in camera angles. Learning, learning to shoot with the camera angles so it looks, I mean, I mean, trust me, I've been engulfed in fire and I've been away from fire and looked like engulfed. And it's just all... Um, how they shoot it, like the, the uh, uh, tombstone, the opening scene. I mean, you look at that one, they walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. They were way in the heck out there with a big long lens, you know, and capturing all that. So, you know, the camera stuff I know a little bit about. I know how to help a director get the shot. But, you know, some of these guys know how to cheat all that and make it look like. I mean, we spend hours uh, when we do a horse ball digging that ground up. They bring the sand in. You know, I'm not going to take one of my guys and throw him off the building and let him roll off on the ground. You know, we put a dump truck full of sand in him and we it out. So there's, you know, that's, it's always prep, always good prep time. You know, so maybe two seconds in a film, but prep time is worth a lot. It's worth a lot. We did a lot of prep time on Stardust and Ben. You know, the, this is what she was talking about. I shot a bottle out of this kid's mouth. But we worked with him 20 minutes just to get him to come back in the same spot with that bottle so I can get it. So, what else do we want to cover? Thread. I get a thread in the microphone, you guys would never get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we were talking about the, the home fire, uh, you said that there's um, a lot of things that we should not try to do. Do <coughs> specific examples on, well, like, setting somebody on fire, or I know you've been around a while, what are right. some of the things that independent people have done and what kind of travesties have happened? The main thing that, that like I said, when I was talking about the, the Grand Canyon, the Kanye West phone, you know, that's, that kind of stuff I run into constantly, it scares the daylights out of me, because they don't see any problem with, you know, um, I just did a film called Saving the Santa, and uh, who did I know? I'm not a little bad with names sometimes. Trace Hackett. Yeah, Trace Atkins was there. 
and he's laying on the ground next to the strip, and they do a, a, a burnout. And they're like, oh, the first day he'll do it. And you're like, yeah, you know. You know. No, you know, it's just, that's that's how they think. Well, it's just spinning the tires. So well, the, well, those things can go wrong real quick. Well, that's why we, you know, when I'm there, I always try to stop it. You know, I, I, I don't, I can think of, I know there's there's probably things, you know, that not not me. I've never broke a bone, never got hurt. Whoa. Never hurt one of my guys. Uh, we were, as a matter of fact, we were doing a high fall into an airbag down the street from uh, uh, another movie. <clears throat> it was basically doing the same high fall. We put safety people around uh, around the sides in case they start to miss. We can. I'd rather ha have them hit me and break a bone than land on the ground and kill themselves. Um, Eddie Murphy did it, and the girl missed the airbag, or she hit on her body, and her head slammed to the ground and killed her. And that was that was just two blocks down the street, and they don't use safety people. And we just recently did a cliff fall. Did that one from. Old Tucson kid. Windy. He stayed, every time he stood up, the wind was blowing. And uh, you know, I kept well, telling him. Well, that was Noel. Noel. And I said, take it on your own cue. I'm not up there. I can't tell what the way the wind's blowing. So I finally, and, I, and those guys, they do a different thing in Old Tucson. They always kick back a little. The way the cliff went, um, I, I tried to add that one, to, but I just didn't have enough time to add it. Because he actually missed the, the boxes. Bounced off your arm. Uh, he bounced off my arm because I dove under him and, and hit his head back onto the box. Otherwise, he'd just smashed in the rocks. So when I had safety people all the way around, so I got I have to tell you, I got in trouble with Amos on that. He seemed like a man of integrity and concern. And it sounds like you really put your foot down and said no. You keep getting work. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they did. You know, I, I mean, if I worked 32 years and not got hurt. You know, plus I, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough in this business when I got into the stunt world. <clears throat> you know, I worked with uh, uh, Glenn Wilder. Glenn Wilder just was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award at the uh, Charles yeah. Academy Awards. And my buddy Terry James just won an Emmy for uh, uh, Young and Restless for doing stunts. It's the same thing there. I mean, they, the same thing he deals with the studios we deal out here is they'll try to grab. Uh, you know, hey, what's a craft service guy doing? Come over here. Well, we need a fire scene where the wall falls in on. You know that we have pads. I mean, I, I've got a pad. I've got a back pad. I've had uh, guys try to do horse falls on me. If you remember on Stardust, the guy said, "Oh, I do these drags all the time without a pad," and I said, "Not on my set." You know, I've had guys try to do horse falls, and they don't use fall rigs. Fall rig is just a little angle. You don't want their foot to stir it. The horse goes over, he's on top of your leg, you have a rope leg. So I make sure the same thing. I do these all the time with a, with a not on my set. I'm the coordinator and I'm going to tell you how to do it. You're going to do it right or it ain't getting done. I'm so. sure that stunt people aren't terribly mm -hmm. inexpensive. I, I, I expect that your rate is probably pretty good. But I am going to guess it's a hell of a lot cheaper than a lawsuit or a funeral. Right. And, and we, I mean, we work, you know, Doing something like Major League Baseball, when I tried to do it for their, which I, I shouldn't have done because I know they got the money, but that's a little different than doing a student film because I did do a stu student film for Rene, I don't remember his name, did you work for Rene? He did his main thing that was a Mexican family and they got an argument and he, he shot his son in anger. His son, his son yeah, shot the dad. He shot, yeah, something like that. He won a bunch of awards and stuff like that, but he came to me and he said, I know there's two things that I'm not skimping on. Effects and stunt coordinator. And he paid for those out of his own pocket, which, I mean, you know, we usually get anywhere from 500 to 700 a day as base rate. And uh, I, worked, I worked for him for uh, four days, I think, for the 500. You know, I just said, I'm gonna, I'll help you with what I can do. You know, and, and we, a lot of stuff we saved him because they were doing bullet hits. And, that was one of the guns where they didn't have, if they were using a real gun, you know, we have to, okay, we'll clear it and I'll control the blanks. And trust me, I was standing right outside the door and when the shot cut, the door opened and I, I got the gun right in my hand, so I had it the whole time. So, um, did that answer the question or did I go clear around the world? <laughs> yes, you answered the question. <laughs> I tend to do that, you know, trip, get off on the wrong exit, you know.
I was on a set last year, I'm an actor, and they had a stunt coordinator who's also the actor doing the shot. And there's a shot of him being a sheriff and he's fighting the guy. And the stunt coordinator got fired because his attitude towards the director, because of what he was saying, this has to be this way in order to work. They got fired for his attitude, and the director had him clashed. So I'm just wondering how you work with directors to also understand your point of view, but you still respect their position. Right. Well, that does happen a lot. Um, you know, I'm not going to try to tell a director how to direct it, although a set coordinator is usually considered a second unit director. You know, so if you get a good director and a good stunt coordinator, it's just going to work out. You know, you're going to bounce off each other and, and work. Um, yeah, I was doing one with Billy Zane out in California. I wasn't the stunt coordinator, but a fire, fire safety officer, and they wanted Billy to run down this color. And if you look down below, all the cement had all the rebar sticking up. Oh. And I said, no. I said, where's, where's your stunt coordinator? Well, he's off today. We didn't need him. And I said, oh. give me a minute. <laughs> and I called him, and he says, absolutely not. And I said, well, I hope you don't mind. I stood in as coordinator for you because you weren't here. And he said, no. You know, so, yeah, we, and we, you know, there's sometimes you just have to say no. Yeah. And the, the, the lead actor gets hurt. Where does the film go? You're done. If he dies, the thing gets thrown in the trash. If he gets seriously hurt, you're, you're hung up until he gets better. So... You know, you get some actors, the same thing. You're going to argue with actors that are going to say, oh, I want to do my own stunt. Okay, what are we going to do? I'm going to sit in the car, it's going to blow up. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, I'm in a fire suit and no max and all that stuff. There's no, no way you're going to do it. So, yeah, there, I mean, you know, there's a point to the argument. You know what I mean? If, it, if it's kind of a dumb review point to be arguing about, you know, if he, because he wants to play it a certain way, I mean, if I'm playing something on the stunt player, of course I'm going to play it the way the director wants to play it. That's, that's he's the director. That was his guy's issue. He wouldn't do what the director was saying. No. That's why he got fired. No, I'd have fired him. Bad too. attitude. <laughs> yeah. I'd have fired him too. So. Smoke effects, like firefighting movies, etc. What kind of materials are used that don't like cause cancer in the actors? That cause cancer? Well, you know, it's really toxic. But what kind of smoke <laughs> is? Acceptable and not so well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they, they pretty much outlined like the walnut dust we're talking about. That's what I wondered about walnut dust. The walnut dust is a, it's a fine ground uh, walnut dust that it, it creates atmosphere. But any kind of substance finely ground, you know, exposed to a spark or a flame, we get the Tucson Community Center. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what happened there. They had that. Um, Read a light broke. Is that what happened? Well, not all the details. Just... He did. <laughs> but uh, basically, they had it in the air, a light broke, and it ignited the dust. So, what do you use for smoke that's safe and low toxicity? Smoke, smoke machine, smoke machine, just machine regular machine, effects. Which is a film? It's a, it fill started out being, you no, know, it is a, a non oil base. Um, they use it just in all the parties, all the smoke machines. Depends on where you, you want the smoke to go up here, you want it to stay down. You can dry, dry ice or you can blow the smoke over ice, which will cool it, push it to the ground. It just kind of depends on what you want to use it for. Um, I've seen, <coughs> I did one, uh, I don't even know if you've ever been to the Comic Corn Maze at Buckley's, I did that for 21 years. But we, uh, <laughs> we attempted to smoke the whole thing up. And after the second call from the fire department, they, the we, yeah, they were using a mineral oil in like a lawnmower machine that has two plates that go together. So there's some stuff that you can get away with using outside instead of inside. Inside, you want to be very careful. This is at Buckley's Farm? Yeah. Yes. During the Halloween show? Yeah. We, we put too much smoke. <laughs> that was an experiment. <laughs> it's like my, my about an oven. And ran a copper coil through it, which ended up working. So we had the, the little uh, NASCAR fans and uh, that long leaching line. And I just bought an old oven, hooked it up to the generator, and the coil went through and it pumped a demand pump and it spit out smoke. But I mean, smoking outdoor stuff's hard. Because you, know, you get it all nice and ready, and the wind comes and off it goes. You're talking about a coaster? Uh, oven. You got a big oven, yeah. Invented. So when you have a disagreement with the director, producer, whatever, like the, the uh, spinning the tires and he wants to just see the first AV, 
And uh, what if they don't accept your position? Um, I've never had them say no. Because I'm going to do a fire safety officer a minute, whatever. So, so you, you can stop it. Shut it out, yeah. if, you know, usually if you go up and tell them that, you know, it's on the same. But the thing I always try to do in the last so many years I've, I've done it is if I go up with something like that to a director, I try to have three or four solutions for it. So I'm not, you know, that's why I said when I went to film school, when I had a director turn around and go, well, how am I going to get the shot? I don't know. You know, so I tried, I learned cameras and went to film school so I'd have a solution for him, or two or three or whatever. So you're not just a bad guy, see? Yeah, exactly. But you, you say, you can't do it that way because, you know, you can't point a gun right at somebody, so try this. You know, try moving the camera a little bit, you know, stagger yourselves a little bit. And I'm not shooting right at you. I mean, I've been, I've been peppered in the face with blanks. How many, uh, uh, when you started in the business, how much of these sa safety standards actually existed? Did they exist back then, or, or have they pretty much come around? You don't want to hear about this stuff, I did. <laughs> we, did, we, did we did running gun battles back then. We'd do a Western show somewhere in the one car fly past and they'd all get out somewhere ahead and jump out of the bushes and shoot at you when you went by. Yeah, that was kind of crazy stuff. I was only 13. Who <laughs> would be responsible? So it, it's uh, the job of, of the uh, stunt coordinator and the armor and the fire safety officer and, and to a certain degree of the first AD to make sure things are safe. But anyone who's working on, on a movie set, if you see something that, that you're uncertain about the safety of it, you should go talk to one of those people and, and say, hey, is this a problem? Should, should we do this differently? Because just because you're not one of those people, you know, you, you're an adult, you, 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 you hopefully have common sense. Well, I guess if we work in this business, we don't. But, but, <laughs> the, but the point is that, that everyone's uh, uh, right and responsibility that if you see something that you think is unsafe, talk to the first AD, talk to the stunt coordinator. You know, don't just, you know, make a panic and start yelling, oh, no, they're, they're going to die. But, but, right, correct, but, but yeah. if you see you something, you, 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 you might be in a position, you might be in a position, because like the, the, uh, the fire safety officer, you, you know, he can't be every single spot on the set. So you might be in a position that you see something that maybe for some reason is hidden from his view or something. So, so if you see it, point it out to those people and make sure that, that uh, things are going to be safe because it's just a movie and, and, and there's no reason for someone to die or... Right, I've been on, I've been on sets where yeah. fire safety officers have gone and checked in the building, checked the fire extinguishers, the pressures, checked with the caterers, and, and I've been on them where they sat and had the coffee. So, you know, they, uh, you see something unsafe, it's always, it's always good to point it out, you know, um, I had some kind of thought, I just saw a puff of smoke. You know, and, and kind of the flip side of that is take some responsibility for your own, your own safety and protect yourself. I, I, any job that I'm working on, I, I always have my own earplugs or ear protection, my own eye protection. Generally, the safety people on the set will have those and provide them, but if you have stuff like that for yourself, if you're on one of these low budget shows and and they don't have it, at least you know you're going to be protected in that situation. Right, all you are going to hear. Um, now I remember. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, one thing that I noticed too in the years of doing this too is because uh, I always try to push safety meetings. You know, a lot of us have been in the business, please, safety meeting, safety meeting. But don't overdo it because I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about don't overdo safety meetings, don't overdo the safety meeting because I've done some of the demonstrations and scared the hell out of the actors yeah. by popping a balloon and then they're like, they're not pointing any gun anywhere near me. So yeah, so you can't overdo the demonstrations and stuff for them. They really get scared to death. You know, tennis balls. I saw them nightmares about tennis balls. <laughs> Anybody else? Any filmmaker needs fire or smoke, what do they call it? Fire, fire or smoke? Fire. Uh, fire, it depends on what you want, because you, know, you can use a burn bar. I go to Home Depot and buy the stuff to make a burn bar to put in front of the thing. If you want heat waves or a little bit of fire, um, I think anything bigger than a burn bar, you're going to have to go get a pyro guy. 